glad you're with us today, glad you're joining us, and uh, it's going to be a, a day, I think, that you'll remember, because I'm going to pose a question today that has been posed to me early on in my life, and it was first posed by Jesus himself, and it's, an answer, it's a question we all have to answer at some point. And really, we're answering it by not answering it all, really. You either are going to answer it one way or continue doing something different. Then question, the great question, the great question that is asked of us comes today from Jesus. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? If you have a Bible, want to turn in the Bible or on your Bible app to the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 27 to 30. Just a few verses, and I want to read those uh, to help us get kind of into the middle of the story where this question is first posed. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi, and as they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked them, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Peter replied, you're the Messiah. And Jesus then warned them not to tell anyone about him in that moment. It was not time. It's an interesting text. There's several things going on there in the book of Mark and those chapters before this and, and after it. A little background, uh, Jesus has gathered with a large crowd, and a large crowd has come to hear, to hear him teach, and this went on for three days, but the organizational committee forgot to bring food, and, uh, which is always a disaster in churches when someone forgets the donuts. Uh, the international food item for Christians around the world uh, is the donut. And some Sundays, it seems like no matter what location I might be a part of around uh, Oklahoma City or wherever I am in churches, whether it's in the backstage areas or out in the foyers, or, uh, there's donuts everywhere. And, and we're just the international donut people are people who follow Jesus. It requires donuts to follow him. It requires donuts to come to church when it's 30 degrees outside. And if it works, we'll, we'll, we'll keep buying donuts. So somebody forgot the donuts the day that they've gathered there on the hill and uh, they're not going to have any food for these people. And so Jesus pulls together the disciples to do something about the problem uh, with thousands of people there and no food. Now you'd think they would have remembered the previous gathering where something miraculous happened uh, to provide food uh, from a few pieces of bread and fish. You would think, oh, let's do that again. But the disciples are doing what is Typical human nature for most of us, even the strongest of believers, is to act like God's never done a miracle before. Oh, now we're, we don't have any food again. Well, Jesus is kind of giving him a chance to uh, vent a little bit, I suppose. When we forget God's past actions in our lives, we forget that all things are possible with God. We want the miraculous Every, every day, every week, every Sunday. Sometimes it's so important for us just to pause and think back to a moment when God really showed up, and it may have been a while. That's okay. You, you may be able to look back to a moment that was an impossible moment for you for whatever reason. Maybe it was an impossible moment in a marriage or a very difficult moment with one of your kids. Maybe it was a difficult moment in finances or job loss. And you can look back at that and you can say, yet God showed up in that moment and got us through it. And we made it. And it wasn't easy. And it was painful. But we got through it. It's good for us to remember God's past actions in our lives so we won't forget that all things are possible with God and once again, on the side of that hill that day, they find seven loaves of bread and a few small fish and thousands of hungry people. And Jesus yet again gave thanks for what they had. And there was enough for everyone, even leftovers again. Several days later, the disciples are in another town and a blind man is brought to Jesus and the people were begging Jesus to heal him so he could see. Jesus did that. People are watching this unfold. They're watching this happen. 
Dallas Willard uh, is quoted quite a bit here frequently. He's one of my favorites. Uh, he's one of the more brilliant minds, and, and he, he's one of, his books are those I have to read a little slower than others to just make sure I catch it all. He's phenomenal. He's now with the Lord, uh, but he's written many, many books. He was on the uh, faculty. He was a, he's a philosopher and uh, had a 48-year thir- tenure at the prestigious uh, University of Southern California. 48 years there as a philosopher of Christianity, a doctoral student uh, came up to him uh, once and said, Professor, uh, why do you, an intelligent, thoughtful, and well-educated man, why do you follow Jesus? And with characteristic simplicity, Dallas responded with a question of his own. He said, well, young man, tell me, who else do you have in mind? And Dallas was not being flippant, but he did say this. He said, tell me who you believe in, and let's make an honest comparison. And if what you believe is, in be- is better than what I've come to believe in Jesus, then I'm prepared to change my thinking. I love a student that would come to a philosopher, brilliant man, writer, author, intellectually, on a par that many people can't even aspire to. He says, why, being so intelligent and thoughtful, would you follow Jesus? And I especially like Dallas Willard saying, well, who else do you have in mind? Jesus looks at us and he says, who do you say I am? You would ask Peter that question on their journey. Peter replied, you're the Messiah. The Messiah. This story, interestingly enough, is written in Matthew 16 and Mark 8, where we've read today, and in Luke 9. Clearly, very important moment in the life of Christ and his teaching. So Jesus, again, he's asking us today. He poses this question, and I felt led that it was a question we had to wrestle with today. We're going to be asking you this question uh, in all of our services, and we're going to give you an opportunity to pray with someone about how you're going to answer the question. Prayer teams will be at the front of all of our rooms, and as people are leaving those rooms later in the, at the end of the service, you'll have a chance to come toward the front and be able to answer the question and at least let, let us celebrate that with you in that moment. You're acknowledging that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's time to stop being vague about this. You see, in a church like ours, it's easy to just get caught up in just how good it is. I don't mean to sound... Uh, uh, cocky about this, but it's a good, it's a friendly place. We have donuts too, you know, everywhere you turn, uh, every hallway, there's donuts. Uh, we have, I think this is going to sound, uh, really bragging, but, uh, I think we have some of the finest worship services in our locations that you'll find anywhere by people who are, who are called to do it. And they love Jesus and they get themselves out of the way and to find this many worship leaders on all our stages who are together in that, of one mind and one heart and one soul to point you to Jesus, not themselves. This is a great place just to come to church. But it might be easy to come here and enjoy it without having to face an answer, a question that you've got to answer. We exist for this question. When Jesus looks at all of us and he says, who do you say I am? Who do you? Larry was talking to the choir earlier this week and some of the worship folks and uh, he was letting them know we were going to be asking this question today, that we we're going to review this question that Jesus asked us. And he, Larry made this great statement. He says, we answer that question every day with the way we live. That's true. And I believe our church, really, one of its primary reasons to exist, frankly, for any church, would be to help us hear that question and at some point answer it. Not everyone is ready to answer that question. I get that. I understand that. That's what I love about our church. But for those who've had time to think about it, again, today is a day I want people to begin to say, okay, I'm ready to answer the question. I'm ready to acknowledge who I now know him to be. 
We're a Christ-centered church helping people find and follow Jesus. That's why we say we exist. God gave us that years ago, and we're still committed to that. We want to help people find and follow Jesus. We want to be people who will walk by faith, be a voice of hope, and be known by love. And God seems to be honoring that in ways that we could never have imagined. But there comes this moment where we all have to just decide, are we in this for ourselves? Are we in this because we want to follow the one who gives us life and meaning? Today, I want to take a quick look at just three simple things on our way to this answer. Three questions. One is, what did he say? Well, I want to review really quickly just a few things that Jesus said that, to me, help us understand the question he asked us. We can know him a little better just in some phrases, and, the, and the, you know, we could spend hours on those phrases in Scripture, but I thought at least let's review some things that Jesus has said, and that'll help us know, do I believe that? Do we believe that? Have we seen evidence of that? Have we experienced it or seen it experienced in someone else? So first, we know what, what are the things Jesus said that prepare us to answer the question? And then I want to I have the courage to say, now what difference does it make? What difference has it made in our culture, in our world, throughout all time, that Jesus is who he said he is? What difference has it made? So Jesus came to us. He was born of a virgin. He spent uh, 33 years on the planet, two of those years walking among us. What difference did it make? It made a lot of difference, but we're going to review that a little bit. Let's look at that. So what has he said? What difference has it made? And as a result, who is Jesus to you, to us? So let's look at this, some things he said. Some powerful things and simple things that Jesus just said that, that I wrote down thinking this would be a great moment to review these things because it helps us, I think, aim us at answering this question in the way we know we would all like to answer it. In Matthew 7, I love this, this text about you've got two choices here. You can build your life on sand, you can build it on the rock. Jesus gives us that choice. Build on the sand or build on the rock. And Jesus is very honest with us. And what he says is true. You build your life on sand. Well, when the storms come, the floods come, you're, whatever you've built on sand is going to collapse. Or you can build on the rock, which means when the storms come or the floods come, nothing will take that house off the rock. It's your choice. I love how Jesus is so good at that, giving us options to say, you gotta choose here. You can go either way. Maybe some of you don't feel like you've been, uh, maybe you've not been aware that Jesus allows us to have choices here. We feel there's a clear choice to be made, but a lot of people need time to get there. That's what I love, again, about our church, giving that time to people who, who need that time. But there's a choice here, rock or sand. Jesus said to us in John 3, 16, God loved this world so much he gave us his only son and whoever believes in him will have eternal life, will never die. Do you believe this, he asks. I, I think of John 1, 1 and then verse 14. In the beginning was the word. And what happened? The word became flesh and lived among us for a while. When Jesus said in John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And the people in darkness have now seen a great light. Whether they acknowledge it or not, they know it's a great light. But who is it? I think of John chapter 1, verse 29, when Jesus said, or John said this to Jesus, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. That meant a lot in those days because a lamb was very special. And the perfect lamb was always required for the appropriate sacrifice to get your sins forgiven. So it's a powerful statement when John says, oh, here's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Or Matthew 20, 28, when Jesus says, the son of man did not come to be served but to serve. That's what threw everybody off in those days. He didn't act like a king. He didn't act like God. 
He didn't strut his authority and his power. He served. He didn't come to be served. He served. When John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Those are powerful statements. So really, at that point, people who were kind of new to all this or not expecting it or who hadn't heard the story are beginning to think this man sounds a little bit like a nut job. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's a bold statement. But he said these things. He prepared us to understand him and what he does and what he will do if we will trust him and if we would come to that moment having done some homework for we can say, that's the Messiah the son of the living God. So he said some things that help us understand who he is. Second question, what difference has it made? What difference has it made? I think it's easy as a church, and I've grown up in church. I've been in church all of my life. And I had those seasons where the holy huddle was so incredible you really didn't think much about trying to get other people to come and experience it. it was, you were just so busy having so much fun in the huddle. And, and we have kind of the same thing. Our, all of our locations, these are wonderful. These are phenomenal holy huddles. Wonderful people. Wonderful worship. Good donuts. That's a theme for the day. <laughs> Decent coffee. And it's just easy to get caught up in it. And we, we get caught up in the fabulous things about the church and we get caught up in being in the church and of the church and with the church and going to church and working at the church and volunteering at the church that we may have neighbors whose lives are crumbling and we haven't had a chance to notice yet. Sometimes we need to get out of the huddle and get out on the field. It might get knocked around a little bit because it's rough out there. But there's times God says, okay, you've been in the huddle. You're ready for the game. Get out there and play the game. Get out there and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Get out there and be people of faith. Be people who will be known by love and bring some hope into this hopeless world we live in. The huddle's so good. Churches can be so fabulous, and I've spent a lot of time in the huddle. I love the huddle, but boy, there's something exciting, often intimidating, maybe even completely frightening. When you have to leave the huddle and say, okay, if what I believe is true, and if what I believe I think so many other people ought to know, and it's time maybe to leave the classroom and set the pencil aside for a time and get out there and do what we already know. To do. It's easy in church to just keep coming by and going, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. I want deep. I want deeper. I just love when I get that. We need deeper. We have deeper. Everybody just wants deeper and they want their worship and they want their donuts in one hour on Sunday morning. We, we have it scattered through the week. It's so easy in church to get caught up in, feed me. Make my spine tingle with the moving worship. And that's all wonderful. Until we forget that there are people down the street where we live or down the hall where we work who could use a little light in their life. Who would show up and just say, you know, I'm loved by somebody I don't deserve to be loved by. His name's Jesus. And he helps me love people who don't feel loved. He's made a difference. We took that uh, trip with Larry and Cliff Sanders uh, a couple of years ago with the choir over to England and did the Wesley tour. And I'm standing in the new room. This is Wesley's uh, sanctuary, this auditorium. He built the new room because the crowds had gotten so large. They had to have a place to gather. And they were meeting outside. They finally have a place to come inside. And, and, and I read the statement of why the room was built. A place where kids can learn a place to provide food and clothing for the poor, a place to provide free medical care, a place to demonstrate love for the prisoner. And someone said, that sounds like a church 
I know about. It was the message of Jesus that caused his followers to build schools so they could educate Christian men and women. Let me remind you, it was, it was Christians, Christ's followers, who built the first universities. And boy, in light of all that's going on lately in universities, this is a sobering thought. It was Christ's followers who first built Harvard. Their mission statement in 1642 was everyone shall consider, everyone shall consider as the main end of life and studies to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That was Harvard, started by believers so people could be trained in knowing what it was like to follow Christ and be a good citizen and work and be productive. Rutgers, Princeton, Dartmouth, Yale, College of William and Mary, all these were built by believers where Christians could gather and learn not just the truth of God, but how to live that, learn skills, learn how to live life in this world, learn how to make a living. That's who built those places. It was believers who built those places. It was followers of Jesus who built hospitals. It was their idea. Orphanages, rescue missions. Condoleezza Rice is just one of my favorites. I, I read whatever she writes. Uh, she's just a class act. She loves Jesus. Uh, she's in John Ortberg's church out at Menlo Park. She was when John was there. I'm assuming she still might be there. It was funny, I had some friends that went out there to, to visit John's church out at, in Menlo, and uh, they walk, were walking in the church, and there was somebody greeting and handed them the, the kind of the worship folder, and they look up, it's Kyleisa Rice. She's a greeter at Menlo Church. I mean, he and uh, John and, and, and Condoleezza, they're, they're friends. I mean, he'll be here in a couple of weeks, and I'm, I may go so far as to say, I know you've got her cell phone number. Could you just dial it and hand me the phone? <laughs> I'll just maybe, you know, think those, those Oklahomans are a little crazy, aren't they? Here's what she said. I, I love what she says here. Those who follow Jesus begin to act as if every life is worthy. The community of people called Christians would minister to the sick and the disabled. They'd build hospitals, pursue universal education, spread teaching through universities, lift up the poor in faraway places, for they would inherit the earth. So, it's time for the question, who do you say? He is. Who do you say? And it's important that you answer the question. John Ortberg did a, a wonderful message, and I've had it in my files ever since. I want to read a paragraph out of the message because he said, after the greatest sermon that was ever preached called the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives this sermon, and then we're told he went up on the mountainside, many followed him there, and he began to teach. And when he finished the talk, we're told the crowds were amazed at his teaching. And here's what happened. There were a lot of people there that day who admired Jesus. They admired him. Great words. An admirer is impressed. A follower is devoted. An admirer applauds. A follower surrenders. A lot of people admired Martin Luther King, and some marched with him, but not many went to jail with him. Not many got their houses bombed like he did. A lot of people admired Mother Teresa, but not many people chose to go live among the destitute and the dying. John goes on to say this, but in that crowd that day, there were some that while listening to him talk, something began to happen in their hearts that went way beyond admiration. And their hearts started pounding, their minds started racing. Something deep inside them said, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for to be valued, to be forgiven, to have all the junk of my life dealt with, to know that I'm loved by God, to have a life that has meaning, to live differently, to feel differently, to feel free. And they say, I would rather have what this man has and give up everything else in the world than have everything in the world and give up this man. Therefore, I will pay any price. 
I don't care. I'll do whatever he wants me to do. Go wherever he wants me to go. I'll give whatever he asks me to give. I'll be whatever he says I ought to be. Today, I'm leaving the crowd of admirers, and I choose to follow. So who is this man to you? Who do you say he is? And I want so desperately to see a move of God in this church. God's been showing up and showing off doing things for us we didn't pray for, didn't plan, didn't have a strategy. And it's not time, this is not a good time for us to take this all casually. I think God's got some amazing things for us to do. Continue doing. Stuff that could frighten us. (laughs) But we need to be sure that we're ready in the name of Jesus to do what he says, to go where he sends us. But it starts right now with every one of us getting clear about the question. When Jesus looks at us and he says, who do you say I am? And I'm just gonna ask you to take some time today and answer it. We're gonna worship for just a moment. We're gonna invite the prayer teams to come to the front of all the rooms We've asked for staff and prayer teams to be a lot of people down in the front of all our rooms. As people are leaving our rooms, you can come toward the front of all of our rooms and there'll be people gathered there wanting to pray with you about anything. You may not have anything to do today with the message. It may be a burden you walked in with, some some hurt you're going through because you've lost a loved one or a friendship has been wounded. Whatever it is that we could just encourage you with prayer, we would love to do that with you as people leave the rooms. But most importantly today, If you've not been completely clear in your answer to that question, and today you're ready to get clear, we just would like to celebrate that with you. We'd like to pray with you as you declare, Jesus, I now know you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, my forgiver, my redeemer, my savior. We wanna celebrate that today. So after I pray, we'll worship a bit, and then we'll close and we'll ask people to be available to you for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of this time to worship. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of the scripture. It's so simple, at times complex and complicated, and we acknowledge we won't understand all of it this side of heaven, but Father, you have posed a great question to us. May we all have the courage to answer it honestly. And for those that aren't ready yet, May they at least give time to pursue whatever they need to come to a place where they can finally with confidence say, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, my forgiver, my redeemer. Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts and minds and thoughts. In Jesus' name.